Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me uh, on a Tuesday night. I know that this is not Wednesday. I do not have a calendar malfunction, uh, it, but it is our, tra- our uh, church's tradition uh, to have the Thanksgiving midweek service on Tuesday instead of Wednesday uh, in order to allow for Thanksgiving travel and families to come together. Uh, I guess this year, joke's on us, um, many of you are already in your Thanksgiving destinations um, and probably in your Thanksgiving attire, but still yet, I wanted to continue. Uh, I, I'm just a person for, for habit, and uh, my wife could tell you that. Uh, I like to keep things the way it is, and uh, uh, so I just have a routine, and, and uh, I like it that way. But tonight, uh, we're going to talk again about Thanksgiving, and um, I've already prepared uh, Sunday morning's sermon for the most part, uh, and, and what you'll see tonight is, is what I talk about will still kind of flow over into, into Sunday a little bit, but I, th- I think that just um, testifies about the power of God's Word and how applicable it is and how it flows together and how it's one part of a big whole. And uh, so I love how God works that way. But uh, let's pray, and uh, I'll get started from there, and then we'll get into uh, what I want to talk about tonight. Master Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence here with us digitally. This is nowhere near like it should be, should we be together and gathered together on this evening and contemplating your mercies as a group. But Father, help us to take these things to heart, to receive what you have to say to us as I just talk to them and give you what I feel that will be encouraging and helpful for us during this Thanksgiving season. Father, bless everything that we say and may you use it for the the furtherance of your kingdom and your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, Tonight I'd like to talk about the Thanksgiving secret. A grandmother was watching her grandson, who's just really learning how to talk, and and, but you know, little kids, they have an attitude. I, I, I don't know who came up with the terrible twos mentality, because I I think that they probably tried to change it once their toddler turned three, but it already stuck. Because anybody, I, I don't know, I've got four children, and each one of them were worse when they were three than when they are two. And by the way, I have one who is three right now. So, so you know the joy of this. Yesterday, she refused to wear a shirt all day long and was cold. But Anyway, we stayed home, or Tammy stayed home with her, so didn't have to go anywhere. But that's just three, terrible threes. I I think that's what it should be. But terrible three, Sean was with his grandmother, and grandmother hadn't kept him much, and she was getting ready to feed him lunch, and she said, uh, stop just a second, let's talk to God about our food, let's pray for our food before we eat it, and Sean refused. He said no, being the terrible three-year-old that he was. She remained calm, and she says, well, at Grandma's house, we pray over our food before we eat. And Sean said, you can't make me. Oh, I'm sure ice ran through Grandma's veins, but Grandma says, well, listen, this is how it works. If you don't eat, if you don't pray, you don't get to eat yet. So the youngster replied, I would have eaten if you had, and I would have said thanks if you would have only made mashed potatoes. If you would have made what I wanted, then I would be thankful. If you would have done this, then I, the, the, I, I would have had joy in my heart. And even though that story is a little comical, and because we know we can relate to that in our children, but I believe that it's also true that we also are a lot like Sean, even in our adult years. We don't like what has been put on our plate, so therefore we throw a fit or we decide that we won't do the things that we're supposed to do. Maybe we think maybe if God would have given us more money, we could have a better 
uh, uh, Christmas this year. If God would have given us better money, we could have afforded a bigger turkey. Or all of these things that we have, these lists of things, and we don't like the yucky stuff that God has put on our plate. But this evening, I'd like to share with you what I can call the secret of Thanksgiving. Because even though we're going into the busiest time of the year where most of us will probably resort to online shopping, but the hustle and bustle and the pressure to perform is beginning to settle in. But as we go into this week and weekend, as we celebrate Thanksgiving and the gift of God's abundance, I want us to realize that the secret to Thanksgiving is hidden in a word called contentment. That, that word that means that I'm satisfied with what God has allowed me to have. Now, the English language, I, I think, is funny because as we're talking about being satisfied and being happy and having joy with what we have, we can't help but notice that the word content is in the word contentment. And, it, and I think it says a lot about our, our American mentality. We, we feel like we can't be happy unless we have content. Content brings contentment. But what I hope to show you tonight is, is that that is not the case. Even when life is hard you can feel grateful. Even when things are against you, even though things are not working the way that we think they should, we can be content. Philippians 4, 11 through 13 is my text for this evening, and I'm going to say for the get-go, this is one of those that I have coined a phrase around here called twisted scriptures. Because the Pharisees did that a lot, but but modern day American Pharisees have twisted this scripture to mean something other than what it should. But we're going to look at it and consider its context. And Philippians four eleven through thirteen says, "Now that that now that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound." In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of placing plenty, of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, people love that verse. I think it's on Steph Curry's shoes. Many use that verse and throw it around, but does it really mean what it Is supposed to mean according to their context. Perhaps we can fully understand this text if you lend me your imagination for a moment. I want you to imagine yourself going through the dark, windy streets of Rome, ancient Rome, and the Apostle Paul is there. He is in confinement. He is in on house arrest. He is waiting trial for basically being nothing more than a troublemaker in the Roman world. His company is not the best because this man, a a preacher and a powerful man of God, the, the author of 13, maybe 14 books of the New Testament, is chained continuously to a Roman soldier. Now in this equation, I feel for the Roman soldier much more than I do for Paul because I can imagine Paul writing letters and and reading it out loud and and asking the Roman soldier, hey, what do you think about this? And and I can imagine to an unbeliever that would probably get on your ever-loving nerves, this man constantly talking about God. But this was the situation, and I'm sure that if you went and you knocked on the door, they would be happy to get some level of break from this man and allow you into the room. And and as you go into the room, you, you step into a dimly lit room and you hear the scribble of a quill on, on, on the paper, putting ink to paper, and he's writing a letter. He's writing a letter to a church in Philippi. And his powerful words, they reverberate against the wall, and and, and we hear this great 
raspy voice. I, I imagine, I, I don't know about you, but I imagine Paul sounding a little bit like the great Adrian Rogers. And, and Paul is reading, is writing, and he's reciting as he writes, and he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For do all things without complaining and disputing. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. All of these words he's writing, and each one of those was from a scripture of this book called Philippians. He, and if you look around and you listen to the words that he says, and you look around the room, and the fact that he is chained to a man continuously who is a Roman soldier would make you think that what Paul is saying and what Paul is, is seeing are two totally different things. He is saying that I can have joy in the Lord at the same time he is in prison. But the truth is, as scholars and theologians will tell you, that Philippians is the happiest book of the Bible. It is the one that offers so much hope in the middle of bad circumstances. How is it that he can write such a hopeful and happy book in such a terrible situation? The answer is here. Paul is going to give us three ways we can find contentment in whatever circumstance we're in. And here is something I want to point out before I go further. It is essential for us to know that if your goal is happiness, and many of you say or many of you think that all I want is to be happy. If your goal is happiness, brother, sister, then that means that happenings have to happen in your favor to find happiness. Your joy is contingent. Your, 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 your feelings, your emotion, what you want is contingent upon what's going on around you. That must not be what Paul was talking about. But what we learn tonight to be joyful is, is you need nothing more than contentment in your spirit. You need nothing more than to realize that what you have in God is enough. For the child of God, regardless of what's happening, we can always find contentment. So how can we find this mindset? First, are you ready for this? We have to learn to be content. I want you to realize that we have to learn to do Being content in your situation is not an automatic acquired behavior. The moment you are saved and regenerated doesn't mean that you're happy with where you are and everything works out well. Paul tells us that you don't get everything you want. And not that I'm speaking of being in need. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be Content. He learned to live with what he did. And there's a big difference. A, a monk, a young man, went into a monastery and decided to become a monk. And he took a vow of silence. He said, for ten years I will not say a word. Ten years went by and the head of the monastery, an abbot, came to this young man and he said, now your ten years is up, do you have anything to say? He said two words. Food, bad. Speaking only those two words, he goes back into his vow of silence. Ten more years later, uh, the abbot comes to him and asks him, says, you have anything to say? It's been ten years. He said, bed, hard. Another ten years went by and the abbot came by and he asked him, he said, do you have anything to say in the Young, now old monk replied, I quit. The abbot replied, that doesn't surprise me a bit. You've done nothing but complain ever since you've been here. Even in this place where he was supposed to be getting closer to God, this abbot was still not content. You see, it's easy to be discontented. It almost seems natural to 
to find ourselves at odds against our situations and to grumble and to gripe. If you don't believe this, read the first five books of the Bible, especially Exodus and and, and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Read those and God's people that God was taking care of. He was being their light by night and their cloud by day. He was their protection. He rained food down from heaven. He was their covering. He was everything that they needed. But yet they still grumbled every single day. God was their king, and yet they still had things to complain about. And, and I want you to do, do, do just a little experiment, experiment. Scroll through your Facebook feed after I'm done preaching. And, and notice how many of these posts are rants or protests against something that is going on in your life or the fact that someone else is not doing things the way that you think that they should and you disagree with them, and so then you post a, about it. And I know this is becoming, even for me, trying to make the right decision and and the leadership of this church trying to make the right decision, but everyone else has a different viewpoint and how I'm wrong or I'm right and they're wrong. But this is just a symptom of our discontentment. But Paul says that even though human nature gravitates towards griping, we can learn to become content. Contentment doesn't come natural. But we can learn the secret of thanksgiving by devoting ourselves. I want you to realize Paul was at once the top of the world. He was the top of the food chain. He was a Roman citizen and he was a Pharisee. So he was entitled to whatever he wanted, but he was so good at being holy that nothing else mattered. He was well educated and he was very well off, most likely financially. But when he met Jesus on the Damascus Road, he forsook all of those things and went into a training ground and became a man of God for real this time. He forfeited his prestige and power and spent the remainder of his life in persecution. But even though he made that decision to live a holy life before God from the heart out, He still had to learn how to be content with what God gave him. It took effort. It took experience. It took listening. It took intentionality for him to learn how to be content. And this is a critical question for today. How many of you watching are willing to learn how to be content Not everyone will say yes to that question. Some of you are perfectly happy living in a discontented manner. Some people are not happy unless they're miserable. And that might be you. I I don't know. Unless things are going against you, you can't find peace in your own heart. Some of you may be too lazy to learn how to be content. It's much easier to let your mind focus on what's wrong than to figure out how to make it right. Everything you don't have, everything that everyone that does wrong to you, what's wrong in the world and, and what's wrong with the people around you, that's much easier to think about those things. And some of you may be watching this evening that are ready to change. And to you, I want to keep talking because you can hear and understand it's not always good to feel the way that you're feeling right now. And in this season where everything is going wrong, God, help me find some way to find peace in my heart. If that's you. I want you to continue listening. Perhaps you want to give up your habit of negativity, and I hope that you can change here today. A dental hygienist was talking to an older man in her dental chair, and she was giving him a pep talk about frequently flossing his teeth. And he simply said, you know, an old dog can't learn new tricks. And the hygienist piped up, and she says he can if he wants to keep his teeth. And that's the situation that we're looking at. Do you want to keep your teeth? Do you want to keep your sanity? Do you want to keep your walk with God at a place where it should be? Learn how to be content in your situation. That is the Thanksgiving secret. That is the, should be the mantra of 2020, as terrible as it has been. 
And a way that we do that is we have to learn how to be content no matter whatever God puts on our plate. Verse 12 said, I know how to be brought low. And I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. A little girl stayed for dinner at a friend's home one night. And a little first grade girl, the vegetable plate comes around the table and it's loaded with buttered broccoli and the mother asked if she liked it and the child replied very politely, oh yes ma'am, I love it. But when the bowl of broccoli came to this little girl's plate, she passed it to the next person. And the mother hostess said, I I thought you said you loved broccoli. And the little girl replied sweetly, oh yes ma'am, I love it, but just not enough to eat it. And and I think that's, that's how it is for us. We say we love God and we love where He puts us and what He has for us, but when He passes around the plate, we freak out because it's despair. Or He hands us a heaping helping of loneliness. Or He spoons out on our plate a little bit of sickness. Oh, we love you, God. We love what you give us, but, but just not enough to eat it and be content with it. We just want the food to disappear, but I want to tell you tonight that there's not a dog under the table that we can give our unwanted helpings to. We have to learn how to be content. The real problem is not what God gives us, but how we take it when He gives it to us. I try to teach my children, it's not about how you react, it's about how you respond. We all have a natural reflex to to respond in a certain way and to react in a certain way. We want to give to them what they gave to us and we want to fight and protest. But, but, But that is not the case for a Christian. A Christian should not react in a reflex type way, but we should respond. We should make a calculated recovery to what someone has handed to us. And that's what it means when we're learning. Uh, We have to realize that I will not allow the external circumstances to affect my internal attitude. Now, I know I'm in a room alone right now, but I'm preaching even if I'm preaching to myself. Let me repeat that. I will not allow my external circumstances to affect my internal attitude. Let me put that a little more plainly. I'm not going to let what happens to me rob me of my joy. Learn to take what God puts on our plate. Paul said, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. I know how to be brought low. I've been to the top of the mountain and I've been to the bottom of the barrel. As a Christian, I've experienced both the share of being abased and abounding. As a Pharisee, he was respected and feared by many. But as a Christian, he was considered a traitor, a heretic, and a loser. Paul was well acquainted with discouragement and disappointment, especially as things he did not, when things did not go as he planned. He knew what it was like to walk on the clouds and to wallow in the pit. But he learned how to do that. Listen to his resume that he gives us to the Corinthian church and to us in God's word. Five times I received at the hand of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers and dangers from robbers and danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship. Through many sleepless nights in hunger and a thirst, often without food and cold and exposure, he was a man who knew what it was like to hurt 
and to suffer. He knew what it was like when God dropped a heaping helping of buttered broccoli when he didn't like it. It should be so easy for us this week as we're sitting around the Thanksgiving table full of turkey and dressing and living in a warm house having clothes and shoes and plenty and all that we need but yet we're sitting there and many of us will not realize the abundance and the blessing that we have because we are still discontent. God, I wish I had a bigger home, a bigger table, a bigger car, a bigger family, a bigger paycheck. Please understand the Thanksgiving secret is understanding what you have and being thankful for it, whatever God gives you. You can choose to be joyful on the inside, no matter what happens to you on the outside. A young man went on a short-term missions trip overseas. This trip went to a very dangerous leper colony on the island of Tobago, off the South American coastline. On that trip, he saw up close what it was like to be ravaged with leprosy, which destroyed bodies and the lives of people. On his final day in the camp, he led worship. And as he was choosing and singing songs, he he asked the group if there was anything that they would like to hear, if they had a special song that they enjoyed. A woman raised her hand with no fingers. He saw the most disfigured face he had ever seen. Her lips were gone. She had no ears. Her nose was rotting off her face. She asked as she raised her hand and he pointed to her, Can you sing, count your many blessings? The missionary started the song, but he could not finish. Tears running down his face, his heart broken. Convicted. Later, someone commented to him, I suppose you you won't be able to sing that song again. And the young man replied, Oh, yes, but I'll never sing it the same way. A woman who had been ravaged by the disease of leprosy, who was losing limb and digits said, count your many blessings because she realized that the day she was given was not promised to her. Do we feel the same way? To be content with whatever God puts on our plate. Finally, we need to learn to be content no matter what God puts on our plate because Christ is enough. Verse 13, verse 13 of Philippians 4 said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Agnes Maud Royden said this, When we have nothing left but God, then you become aware that God is enough. I often say something similar and say you'd never know Jesus is all you need until he is all that you have. And most of us would rather take me at my word and take Agnes at her word without discovering it by experience. But Paul validated these words by his experience and by his life. And this statement is true. Testimony. The words of verse 13 have comforted and encouraged many people and many troubled hearts, but they've also been misconstrued by others. Some see this verse as the Superman verse. They want to do something very hard or very difficult, maybe even impossible, and so somebody tries to tell them they need to be careful, and they say, but don't be afraid. I can do all things through Christ. I can jump over buildings and fly faster than a speeding bullet. 
was that what Paul meant? Paul wasn't promising superpowers. He isn't urging us to take foolish chances and depend on the Lord to help us sort out the damage after we've done it. But he is saying that if Christ is the Lord of your life, you have everything you need to be content in any moment that he has brought you to. If God brings you to it, brothers and sisters, he will bring you through it. When you have Jesus, you have all you need. You can do all things, endure all things, because contentment and thanksgiving is found in Jesus Christ. Finally, I reminded of a man by the name of Tim, Tim Vanderveen. College, he was a tall, broad shouldered, curly haired young man. His smile was broad, and he was as handsome as a young man could be. But after graduating college, he took a job, and he scurried quickly up the corporate ladder, and it looked like everything was going in his favor. One day, one November afternoon, Tim called his former professor, also named Tim, Professor Tim Brown. Tim Brown was a professor who taught Tim Vanderveen in school, but he was also a former pastor of over 20 years. Professor Brown picked up the phone and said, Hey, Tim, how's it going? How are you doing? And and a weak, trembling voice came across the receiver and he said, I'm not doing so good, Professor Brown. What's up with you? exchanged conversation, and Tim said, I, I'm in the hospital in Grand Rapids, and I've got the flu or something. My folks are out of country, and I was just curious, if you're in the area, would you mind stopping by? And Professor Brown said, I'm going to be in Grand Rapids later today. Maybe I could come by and see you, and so would that be okay? And Tim said, I, I'd, I'd like that a lot. But by the time Professor Brown visited Tim, the doctors had already been in the room. And they gave him the news that what he was experiencing was not leukemia, or was not the flu, but rather it was leukemia. Now, three years later, in room 5255 in Spectrum Hospital, Professor Brown walked into Tim's room. He saw Tim's mother sitting in the corner, and she was crying, and Tim was lying on his side. There were pillows positioned in between Tim's legs, bony, now bony and skinny legs, to give him some comfort. He had withered away to nearly nothing. His hair was not curly anymore. His shoulders were not so broad. His smile was not the same. There wasn't enough energy really for him to look up so the professor gets down on one knee so he could look him in the eye and he said, hi Tim. And Tim said, hi professor. There was a long, awkward pause. Even though Professor Brown had been a pastor for 20 years, he found himself at a loss for words. But finally, Tim broke the silence and he said, Professor, I've learned something. And just to interject in my story, listen to last words. They always tell us something wonderful. And this professor knew that as well. So he stopped, he focused on what Tim had to say. He said, I've learned that life is not like a VCR. Now, I know that you are just as confused 
by that statement as Professor Brown was. So he says, Tim, I, I don't understand what you're trying to say. What do you mean? Tim said, it's not like a VCR. You, you can't fast forward through the bad parts. Then as they sat there in silence, Tim interrupted again. But I have learned that Jesus Christ is in every frame. Brothers and sisters, we are living in a global pandemic. No one has the right answers. Everyone feels like they do. Many of us are prohibited from gathering in groups or having a funeral, a full-size room, or some, even including us, have, have, have saw fit, understood it best to even suspend weekly gatherings for a time. Everyone in this season has lost something or someone. I hope you hear what I have to say tonight. We can learn that Jesus Christ is in every frame. And because of that, we can have the joy of the Lord in our hearts now, I'm going to preach more about that Sunday because it's in the next text. It's in John chapter 16. Jesus teaches us that we can have joy in every frame. So as I close this thing tonight and I get ready to go turn this stream off, I want to ask you, do you have Jesus today? Maybe the reason you don't feel thankful is because you're not like Tim. You don't see Jesus in every frame. Maybe because you don't have Jesus in your heart today. Perhaps you feel far away from Him. Perhaps you have been saved. You have given your heart to God, but you have fallen away from Him. You found yourself growing cold, and, and everything in this life seems to make it even more bitter inside you. I want to remind you this tonight, th this evening, as I am streaming this, you need to come back home. You need to leave whatever you are entangled in and return to the Father. Repent of your wickedness. And let God, allow God, or, 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 or put your faith back into Him and, and make sure that you are connected to Him fully. And nothing is hindering your flow, His flow of His Spirit through you. I want to pray for us this evening as I close. Master, Heavenly Father, we... Thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together, virtually. I know that I have preached even to myself as I wrestle with the distractions you have allowed in this year. But Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me for anything and everything in my heart that is unlike you. Anything that has hindered the connection that I have with you through Christ. I can only function properly when the, the life of the Spirit is flowing through me and when I am filled with your Spirit because of Christ. Father, I pray for our viewers tonight. I pray for our church who is battling with this diseases and with family issues and with life and that we learn that, God, this heaping 
a, a serving of, of whatever it is on our plate is there because you have chosen to dish it out. Father, I thank you for all these things. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for one more day that I do not deserve. And I thank you for this congregation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you. I I don't just say that as a way to end the broadcast every single time I see you. I say it because you need to know it. I say it because you're always on my mind and always on my heart and always in my prayer. I I, I say that because Jesus loved me first. And I'm here for you. The best that I can be. We need each other right now. I love you. May God bless.